think I reach five seconds now, so. Can it? Okay, start, okay, all right. Don't have to click anything, just start. I think I reach five seconds now. Yeah. Okay, all right. So good day, everyone. Right. Yeah, I'm ready. Good day. Okay. Good day, everyone. Uh, Good day, everyone. And welcome again to another animal production and health Facebook live presentation. Today, I will be doing common problems. Good day, everyone. You can see that. Oh, hold on. Can I start over? Okay, let me start over. Okay. Good day, everyone, and welcome to all our viewers today. Um, today, we are going to do another one of our animal production and health Facebook Live presentations. My presentation today is called Common Problems in Small Ruminants, and you can see it on the screen there. Today, and I will be doing three topics. The first is how to identify sick animals, because you really need to know how to identify a sick animal to know if an animal is normal or if they're sick. And then we'll move on to a viral disease that we see commonly in Trinidad, or. And finally, I will do pregnancy toxemia, which is a, a metabolic disorder or condition of sheep and goats. At an Another time, I will do other common problems that we see. The objectives today of these presentations, particularly today, is that participants will be able to identify a sick animal, recognize common health problems in their flock or herd, and be able to treat or manage these problems. And if you have more complicated cases, refer them to a vet. So, why do you need to identify a sick animal? Well, you need to identify sick animals early so they can be treated. You need to identify them so you could prevent spread of diseases to other animals and also to humans for those diseases that can be spread to humans. You need to be able to identify them so you can protect our food supply. And you know, it's important for us to have a decent food for supply in our country. And also, more importantly as well, to improve animal welfare. So, how do we identify a sick animal? Well, one of the things that's important as a farmer or owner of an animal is that your animals must be monitored daily. Some areas of focus include looking at the animal's general appearance, look at their appetite, look at their temperature. Of course, you need to have a thermometer or you can just touch the animal and sometimes most people know when an animal has a fever because the animal obviously will be very will, be, will feel hot and look at their hydration status whether they're dehydrated or not look at the animals whether they are discharges for example if there's a nasal discharge if there's an ocular discharge or if there's a uterine discharge whether there's diarrhea when you uh, in the pen or if the tail has uh, diarrhea or, or present of feces on the tail so let me go a little further into this. Owners or caretakers of animals are, first, are the first people who normally will see signs or abnormal signs and symptoms that may indicate an emerging disease or problem with the animal. So it's good to know the normal temperature and ranges, temperature ranges of animals. For example, even though we're doing sheep and goat, I just put in dairy cow. Usually a normal range of temperature for dairy cow is 38.0 to 39.3 degrees Celsius. A sheep is between 39.3 to 39.9 degrees Celsius and a goat 38.5 to 39.7. So you see it's good to have a thermometer. You can always purchase one at the pharmacy. Most of them range between 40 to $50, a digital thermometer that is. So it's good to have one if you are a caretaker or owner of an animal. So continuing, you need to develop what we call a systematic approach, right? Certain things you do when you stand and you look at an animal. So you observe the animal at a distance, observe the animal when it's resting. Look at the general appearance of the animal. 
For example, if the animal is pantive or they salivating, it could be a sign that this animal is not well. Compare the animal's behavior to the pen if you have more than one. Compare their behavior to others. Look at the animal's attitude. Observe the eyes, the ears. Sunken eyes, for example, and droopy ears indicate a sign that something is wrong with this animal. Look at the conjunctiva. That can give you an idea if the animal is anemic, particularly if the conjunctiva is pale or white. Usually the conjunctiva is just, just, just below the eyelid. You pull down the eye and you can look at it. And usually it's nice and pink. So if you see it's pale or, 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 or whitish, that means there's a, there's a problem. This animal is anemic. So it may be the woman or there may be another problem with it. Sick animals generally stay away or isolate themselves from a herd. They move slower and with less energy, which means they're usually weak or they may be lying down often. So, you know, there's a sign that something is wrong with this animal. So here I have a picture here of a black belly ram. And you see he's looking at me because I'm the photographer at this point. He looks alert, looks bright. So when you're looking at an animal at distance, what rests, you look at the animal, you start systematically. You can start from the head and then move to the left and go around to the back by the tail and come around to the right and get back to the head again. So if, if you look at this animal and the picture, you see he looks alert, right? Um, you look at his, how he's standing. Um, you can look as well, you know, uh, he's a male. So you look at the tail to see if there's any signs of diarrhea. You look at the pen, you see um, feces. There's no sign of diarrhea there because it's nice, strong pellets. And he seems to be fairly okay. You look at the general body condition, you look at the, the hair coat. There's another picture of two other animals, a goat, right? And uh, a sheep. Um, and you look at, the, they, some of them have a tendency to wool, so you, you can also look at that, but that, that will just give you an idea, especially if they're very um, thick and woolly and it's very hot, you might see them panting, right? And that's not, not necessarily means that they're sick. It could just be that the amount of um, heat generated by that wool on the animal's um, coat can make them a little more uh, susceptible to heat distress. And on the left of the screen, you see a goat there, and you see he looks rather interested at you notice uh, how he stand, you, and you, you can look at it and you know both of them are male. So just an example of what you do. And I'll, I'll talk a little more about this. All right, this is another picture of some goats there. See, they seem to be quite interested. And these are Anglo, and you look, you can look at their feet, you look at their head, you see no discharges from the eyes or the nostrils. Um, and one common thing is goats normally have their tail up, where sheep have their tail down, right? So you can see if there was any diarrhea or anything in that pen, clearly. So again, talking about sick animals and identifying them, you look at the appetite. You look at the pen, look at the amount of grass or the feed eaten and compare it to herd mates in the other pen, especially if they're in a group, right? If they're by themselves, you could still look at their feed and notice, you know what normally our owner would know how much animals, how much feed animals normally eat how much grass they eat, so you will know if they don't eat enough. That's, that is a sign that something might be wrong. Look at their hydration status. And normally what we do is use a skin test to determine if he or she is well hydrated. Look at the eyes. If the eyes are sunken, it generally indicates dehydration. All right. Look at the feet and legs. And I just showed a picture before. Check to see if the animal is standing or walking normally. Look for swollen joints. And especially if you purchase an animal, check the hoof for lesions. Sometimes you may see the hoof overgrown. That not, that's not really a disease. It just means that the animal has been practice and you may need to trim the hooves, right? When you're walking around the animal or standing, looking at it, look at the other, especially dairy goats, and observe the other for signs of swelling. You can examine the teeth for lesions if you notice it's swollen. So that will help you as well. And the rumen, when you walk around the animal, the rumen is usually on the left. Um, and you check for the signs of bloating if the animal is bloated or if there are any abnormal swelling on the left side. Um, that normally gives you a sign or tells you that the animal might be bloated, right? Moving on, another area, you look at the animal's coat. A dull coat or increased shedding of hair or ball patches could indicate that the animal has some kind of skin condition. 
So that's something you want to look at. Um, the uterus or the vulva area, you look for discharges and whether the discharges, if, if it's foul smelling. If there's a regular discharge, most farmers would do, if an animal is in heat, you may see a slight a mucus discharge or uh, a whitish discharge, which is clear, right? A clear discharge. And that is normal for an animal in heat. But if you see a discharge and that is foul smelling, or it looks unusual, you know there's something wrong with this animal. Another thing you need to observe is whether the animal is urinating. And if it is, if they're having difficulty in urinating, particularly meals, because sometimes, especially with goats, if they are on a high concentrate diet and they don't drink enough water, we, you could have kidney issues, uh, kidney stones, and it, they may show that as difficulty in urinating, or they may have a urinary tract infection and urinating more often than normal, right? Another thing you look at is the feces, and you observe the feces for loose stool, or whether it has blood in it. Now, all these different um, ideas or uh, uh, points that I'm giving you. Over time, if you look at your animals, you will eventually realize you can do this within three to five minutes. It sounds like it's a long time, but once you get yourself accustomed to doing a systematic approach, you will recognize you get better over time and you can stand and look at an animal and within five, three to five minutes, you can tell if this animal is ill or showing signs of some sort of condition or disease. Lastly, I just want to put in a plug here for record keeping. I said that you should have a thermometer handy and record temperatures, um, especially if you notice the animal not doing well. Um, you should keep a record of problems you have identified when you observe these problems so you can give a proper history or you can be able to speak to the vet and let them know what's happening, how long it's happening. So it will assist your veterinarian in treating or managing the problem. Records is always important, especially if you have sick animals. It's good for you to put a list, a note of how many sick animals you have, what species, what is their ID, if you have an ID for them. And if it was treated, whether you treated it or the vet treated it, what treatment, if any, was given for future reference. So you know, okay, this animal has a history of X or this animal has a history of Y. So I'm just putting in a plug here for farmers to know once you're dealing with animals, record keeping is very important. And now I will move on. Diseases today that I wanted to share with you, and this is called. Okay. Um, if you see the screen here, look at the screen here. See two animals here, and look at this area here. Just around the comb the mouth. You see, there's a lesion here, and this particular lesion is consistent with both, right? And the other animal around the mouth, just around the mouth, and you will see a lot of a thick crusted area, and that is off as well. What exactly is off? You must, off is also known as scabby mouth, and it is caused by a virus from the pox family. It is also known as sore mouth, scabby mouth, or contagious ectima. This disease is a disease that can be spread to people and usually nodules are seen on the hands. I'll talk a little more about that later on in the presentation. Usually the signs are seen within two days of infection. This is in, in sheep or goat. And by 11, the 11 day, scabs can be seen which can stay on the animal up to two weeks. This disease of can be spread from animal to animal or by objects which the animals come in contact with. The virus can remain in the scab and it can be viable in the environment for months to years. Disease is often seen more severe in goats than in sheep. And we see this pretty often, especially in the South region. Farmers tend to go and they buy animals and they don't look at the animals properly. And then they bring it onto the farm and they don't isolate the animals. And I'll talk a little more about that. And eventually, more than one animal becomes infected because the animals, you know, animals, they go and they smell each other, they, 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 they feed together in the same trough, and that's how it will be spread.
So what are these signs of O? Usually you see a pustule or the fill and it will form the eyes, the ears, and the ears, as well as the other or between hooves. As I said before, animals tend to, when they feed it in a trough, or sometimes they nibble at each other's ears. Um, if they have babies and they have off, and the babies nurse, um, especially if it's on the other, that the, the other, and they sometimes you have cross nursing, like they will um, nurse from a mother and go to another mother. That's how it could be spread um, on the others. And um, when that happens, the mothers or the ewes or the, the, the does, they don't want to nurse the young. And most animals, because of this bleb or this cow around their mouth, it's difficult for them to feed. They don't want to feed because it's painful. They would hardly eat their grass because it's also painful, right? So the lambs and kids are will, are will be the ones most at risk as the dam will not want to nurse them because of the pain of nursing with this lesion on the other. Another picture of off or scabby mouth, and this is where it starts to crust. And you see these really um, bad crusting around the mouth, near the nostrils. And on the, on the other picture, you will see um, on the air, really bad crusting. So this is where it has the disease. It has progressed and it really looks bad. Now, these are not my pictures, I'm not my mind, so I'm incredibly dead. But I just wanted to show you how important it is in terms of how the disease progresses. This is the picture that we took in Trinidad of another goat. And if you look at the mouth, you'll see crusting all around. So, this is a local picture of a goat with, with, with off. And imagine how difficult this would be for an animal to try to eat. Now, because I said that this, this has implications for people. Notice the person is wearing a glove. So if you have this disease in your animals, it will be important for you to wear gloves once you see that they, um, there are small lesions on the mouth. about how you manage and manage. And when I say manage the disease policy order, to minimize the disease on your farm. So if you see an animal with that type of lesion, the bleb, the waterfall bleb, um, watery, um, or the crusting, whether you see it on the mouth, the ears, the hoof, the, the breast, um, one of the things is uh, isolate the animals very early once you see it. You need to monitor these animals daily. So these animals should be managed separately from the rest of the herd. And if it's possible, once you see them, to move them to a separate pen away from the others, you move them, but you attend to them last. You see all your, your, your animals that are not sick first and those animals you go to last. Depending on the size of your, your farm, you may, and if you have workers, you may want to have somebody alone handle the sick ones and somebody else handle the ones that are well. Always remember, even though an animal is not well, you must provide them daily with fresh, clean water, grass and feed, okay? Vitamins will help it because this disease will also stress the animals. So vitamins adding to the water will help with the stress levels. The young lambs and kids, if the mother has the disease, may need to be bottle fed because obviously they, will, they, will, they may not allow the lamb to feed. And you can also give the lamb oral electrolytes, you know, simple G-Sol or any sort of electrolytes that you can get at the agro shop, as well as some glucose that will help them because of the stress levels and the fact that they're not getting um, the, um, the, the mother's milk. So you can, you can, you can, if you have mothers that you can get milk from and cross um, feed with a bottle, that might be better for you. Now, since it's a viral disease, because a, a virus causes disease, antibiotics are not necessary because this disease it will, the lesions will clear up in one to four weeks without treatment. The only time we, we advise for antibiotics to be used is if the sores become infected or the, and then you would need antibiotics topically or systemically. But most times you do not need antibiotics because the disease will go through the course, 
it, the, the, um, you will have the scabbing, eventually it will dry up, the animal will be fine. Generally, we find that the ones that we need to treat would be the lambs, the very young ones, the lambs or the kids. So when you see the crusting, like I showed earlier in the picture, the crust should not, should not be removed because removing crust can cause a delay in healing and it will also increase the handler's chance of getting infected. So don't interfere with the crust, leave them. Usually they will fall off, right? And you will, you will disinfect your pen, etc. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But animals who have had this disease and gotten over it can become reinfected more than once. But usually if they do become reinfected, it is usually less severe than the first time around. Most times they have some sort of immunity and they don't get it, but they can be reinfected if you, if just so that you know that it can happen. So then how do you prevent a disease like this? Well, one of the main things that my colleague Dr. Singh had spoken to you some time ago about a biosecurity. And this is one of the things that you want to do in terms of livestock biosecurity. Always quarantine new animals three to four weeks of quarantine. I've had many farmers complain to me, they buy animals and then they put it right into their pen or with their herd and within a week or two, the animals come down with, oh, with, with this particular disease. So always important to have them quarantine three to four weeks, put them in a pen separately or another area so you can monitor them. Now you don't bring the disease to your farm. And after three to four weeks, most diseases would have shown up if the animal was exposed to it. And that happens with wolf as well. So another thing is to buy from farms free of infection. So when you're buying animals, examine them. Just like I talked about how to identify a sick animal, you stand up, you look at them, their general appearance, you look at them when they're resting, see whether they're eating well, whether there's any discharges. That's what you need to do when you're buying animals. Don't buy, you know, as we say in Trinidad, kept in that, because you buy it and then you bring it to your farm and then your farm, your animals get infected. So another thing is, if you do have this disease on your farm and you did have it in a particular area, you disinfect your pens and you disinfect your floors, right? Use the foot bath between pens. If you don't have a pen or you have one pen, you put a foot bath, right? Uh, usually, um, there are a list of disinfectants that you could lose, DH4, even Clorox, if you, you have nothing, even black disinfectant may not be the best, but there are a number of them that can, but what you need to do, understand is that if you're going to disinfect um, your, your pen or you're going to use a foot bath, you want to be able to use a disinfectant that can take high organic matter, meaning feces and dirt, so that it will be effective if, once you walk through with your boots or you walk through with your shoes that have mud on it, right? So that's one of the things that you need to know. And minimize your traffic between infected areas. So let's say you had two pens and one particular pen had the animals with off. You make sure you see that pen last, but you must have a foot bath between pens and you try to minimize traffic. As I said, you go to that pen last or you have somebody go there last. So moving on talking about the effect on humans. Now, often humans, um, one of the things you want to do is if you do have this disease on your farm, one of the things you want to do is to wear gloves, use sanitizer, wash your hands thoroughly. And we pretty much know about that now. You know, washing hands is an important part of this pandemic. So, you know, you do that as a normal part of your daily routine once you have animals. So you, you, you wash your hands, you, you wear gloves, you use sanitizer once you see this lesion, right? But it's a general rule of thumb. Wash your hands before and after you work with animals. Now, what happens is if, if it's seen, if, if you are exposed to it, you have an abrasion on your hand and you expose to an animal and you do get it, what you can see is nodules on your hand and there's a picture there um, of somebody's hand uh, with a, a nodule and within three to five days after infection, th that nodule will come up. Persons can or may get a mild fever or they may feel very tired. But what, what is important to note is that this 
disease cannot be spread from person to person and it's self-limiting. So once you may have had the, the lesion, and you, you can treat it, or if it, let's say, um, you can call your doctor and, you know, have them look at it for you, but usually it will go away. But it's important to know that doing, making sure that you have proper hygiene, that will reduce the disease in people as well as in animals. So I'll just go back a bit. Um, any questions on this disease, I will handle at the end of the presentation. All right, so this is the end of my presentation with respect to off in both animals and, and people. So I want to move on now to another disease. Well, it's not really a disease. I should say it's a metabolic disorder or condition that we find fairly often in Trinidad. Um, one of this called pregnancy toxemia. And pregnancy toxemia, the other name for it is twin lung disease. So that kind of tells you how you, you know, why you tend to see it. So you see two pictures here. One is a, a sheep. And if you notice, this animal is down and you see a rounded area by the abdominal part of the animal. It tells you this animal is having some sort of stress and she's not standing, so she's unable to stand and that's because she's having a problem. And I want to thank my colleague, Dr. De Leon, for this picture. On the right is a goat that um, also had a, a, a problem with, with pregnancy toxemia. And if you notice how this animal is also sitting down, she's unable to stand, and there's this bulge around the abdominal area as well. Okay, so what exactly is pregnancy toxemia or twin lung disease? Well, really it's a metabolic disorder caused by low blood glucose and excessive fat breakdown to compensate. Usually the animal has a sweet smell on its breath, and that's because of the ketones, ketones that are produced from the breakdown of fat. And it's also caused by poor nutrition during last trimester of pregnancy. So the U or the do cannot meet the requirements for the unborn. And it usually occurs in females carrying two or more fetuses. And it will also be caused by overfat use where fat breakdown occurs. So there's a number of, of things that happen with this particular problem. Just to say, we tend to see it more in sheep than, um, than in goats. We tend to see it more in black belly sheep because they tend to have two lambs up to four lambs at times. Just Im imagine an animal having two lambs or more. And as the pregnancy develops, the fetuses develop, and there's pressure also on the the animal's abdominal area. So you have the rumen not being able to expand as much as it's like because these fetuses are developing. So the animal can't really eat the amount, especially if they have two or more fetuses, can't eat the amount of food necessary to carry them to tomb, right? And we tend to see it, as I said, more in the black belly sheep, more than you would see it in goats. What exactly are the signs of pregnancy toxemia? Well, most cases can be detected one to three weeks before birth. And I know you will probably ask me, well, then what is the um, length of gestation for an animal, right, a sheep or a goat? And it's good for you to know this because that helps you to understand why you can see the cases one to three weeks before birth. So I'll just uh, give me a minute. Usually, most animals, sheep and goats, is usually 150 days is the gestation period. You can have as early as 142 days animals actually given birth. A sheep is normally around 152 days, um, sorry, 145 days to 150 days. So you can get some of them given birth earlier or given birth later. So we tend to say to farmers, Think about five months. That's usually around the time that most sheep and goats will give birth, right? So then with pregnancy toxemia, you tend to see these cases like one to three weeks before birth. So that gives you an idea of when to see, when you can expect it. If the animal, however, is a dairy goat, you might see milk production being decreased and you want to know well, why. Because this animal is trying to pre preserve her energy for the final giving birth for the animal. The appetite is usually decreased. And if you see the animal in a herd, this animal tends to lag behind in the herd. The herd is moving about and she's slower. 
right? They will tend to spend a lot more time lying down more than their herd mates. So you know something is wrong because I told you with sick animals they tend to stay away or isolate themselves from the herd. The animal with, with pregnancy toxemia becomes listless. Sometimes when it as a disease, well, uh, sorry, as the condition progresses, you can see muscle tremors. They walk listlessly, like aimlessly. They don't know really where, where they're going. They stargaze. They seem, seem to want to look up a lot. Sometimes the eyes become cloudy, but that's not all the time. And they may grind their teeth. Now, something to note about grinding teeth, an animal in pain generally will grind their teeth. So you know, once you, you, you hear that grinding of teeth, you know things are really bad with this animal. So eventually, as the disease progresses, uh, sorry, as the condition progresses and the animal doesn't do well, and if it's not treated timely, they will become recumbent. They will lie down and, if, and they can die if left untreated. So this is a condition that you need to look out for, especially if you have um, animals that are having two or three more two or three um, fetuses, and particularly those lambs, or sorry, those, those ewes that have had three or four pregnancies with lambs in previous pregnancy, like two or three or four lambs, right? So that is something you need to look out for. Right, so how then do you deal with this situation? So how do we manage pregnancy toxemia? So one of the first things is to know what it is like, so you could look at it and detect it early. One of the things we recommend to farmers is drench, which is giving the, this orally, 50 mils of propylene glycol, which can be found in most um, agro shops. And if you can't get propylene glycol, you can also get glycerine. And you give the animal this twice a day until the animal lambs, once they're showing these signs that I talked about earlier. You can get glycerine in most pharmacies. Usually they sell at, at 100 mil. So you may have to look at some places that may sell it as a gallon. But you can also get the propylene glycol at agro shops. Another thing to help them is adding oral calcium to the diet. There are some liquid preparations with calcium in it that you can buy. And obviously, um, giving them vitamins to supplement is an excellent idea because especially the vitamin Bs is excellent for stress. So that is something oral vitamin B can help or you can give something simple as hemoplex or red cell, which are um, oral vitamins that you can use. Um, when it is difficult to manage, meaning that you realize things are really getting, it's progressing and you yourself can't handle it, um, before it gets to that stage, you call your vet, all the county vets, with uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, you can call the different offices and the vet may administer intravenous glucose or electrolytes. If the disease, uh, the, sorry, the condition progresses more to the point where you re the vet realizes that the animal is at risk, meaning the lambs at risk and the you at, at risk, they may need to abort the lambs. And in certain conditions and situations, I should say, um, you may need to do a cesarean section in advanced cases of this problem to save the you and the fetuses, right? And so this is how we manage this particular problem. Okay, so now we talk a little bit about prevention. How do we pre prevent a problem like this from happening? Well, it is a problem that you need to look at in terms of your nutrition. So, um, adequate nutrition must be given in the last four to six weeks of pregnancy. Good quality grass with concentrate, and I give an example of in, in terms of the amount of concentrate. 0.5 pounds to 1.5 to 2 pounds per head until birthing. So this will help this animal in terms of its nutritional content to help, so, so they can carry the babies to term. Also, you can feed corn and corn is a high energy supplement and corn will help the animal into, once they have this condition. Um, exercise also is important to reduce obesity in early pregnancy. You remember I talked about, it could also be that if the animal is over fat, you can you have this condition. So exercising your animals, particularly if they're obese, you know, you let them out of pasture and you bring them in, that will help. And of course you want to reduce stresses, any kind of stress will precipitate problems for any animal, but especially so when they are pregnant. 
So these are some of the things that you can do to reduce the, the um, presence or the prevalence of this particular condition. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. I will take questions. I do appreciate you logging on and listening to what I have to say. And I just want to let you know, at other times, I will bring in other different problems in small ruminants. And if there are any particular problems that you are facing out there with your small ruminants and you would like us to do a presentation on it, feel free to let us know on our Facebook page. I thank you for your patience and I will take questions now. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I want to answer Anjani Morgasi. You asked if how do you know if a ram is clamped when you are buying it? Okay, so you you stand and you look at the animal's um, scrotal sac, and usually, if the animal is not clamped, you will see the testicles. If it is that the animal has been clamped or castrated, and there are different types of castration, you will notice that the scrotal sac is very small. You can ask the person to examine it, put on a glove and feel it. If the animal is clamped there, you wouldn't feel anything, or you would feel with a small, a small little pebble type, you know. And rabbits. Oh. And rabbits. Okay, well, I will have to present that at another time. The person asking about rabbits. Well, thank you so much, everyone. If you still have a question, um, you can post it on the Facebook page and we will try our best to respond to you. I hope that the presentation today has made a difference for you, the listening um, public, and particularly people who are rearing animals. Thank you so much. Is it a good thing to give on? With respect to the wet feed, you can give them wet feed, but it must, it must be that the animal has eaten most of it in a short space of time. Because if you leave the wet feed outside, it can attract flies, and flies obviously will bring bacteria, and then you can have a diarrhea. Okay? Sometimes when an animal is not doing well, a lot of farmers will put the feed in some water and let the animal sort of drink it, and that will help. But um, it, it, it depends. You can type all the response Okay, thank you.